All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to a new studio space here at Hickory Hacker headquarters. Um, if you've been following this channel for any length of time, you may have heard me reference the fact that uh, the other half of the basement, one half being the workshop, the other half of the basement was an unfinished space that um, needed some updating. And I was going to use that as kind of my uh, Hickory Hacker golf museum when uh, I was able to finish it. Well, um, as you probably are aware, a few months ago, I posted a video uh, that kind of said I was going to scale back the frequency of posts on YouTube because I was burned out. And um, that has given me extra time and, um, you know, a whole bunch of extra obvious benefits um, to be able to focus on some things that I hadn't been able to when I was just focusing on posting a video every week on the channel. So I should say thank you so much to everybody for your support and your patience with me as I've been kind of going through this transition. Um, you know, the response to that video and then after the fact has been fantastic. I've gotten a lot of emails and messages from folks just sharing the fact that they're appreciative of the channel and, and what it's kind of inspired them to do and get interested in as far as Hickory Golf is concerned. And it was really um, uplifting for me to get those messages after I posted that video, which, um, you know, sort of felt like kind of a funeral in a way, because it was like I was recognizing the fact that I wasn't going to be able to maintain this channel to the uh, degree that I had hoped earlier in the year. But um, as I, you know, I won't belabor the point, but I, you know, touched on this in the video that um, being able to recognize I needed to step back has been um, really great for me because not only am I getting more stuff done that needed to be you know, addressed in the house and in the workshop, um, but it also kind of gave my brain a chance to reset and, and um, recalibrate and really focus on what it is about the channel that kind of drives me and what I want to continue to do with the channel. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had just been sticking to the grind of a video a week. And now I think my frequency is probably a video every two, three weeks. Um, I'm hoping to actually increase that a little bit to at least two weeks um, as we get into the colder months when there's a little bit uh, more time and not as much time for me to do stuff outside. But for the time being, I'm going to stick with kind of where we're at and post stuff when I feel like I have something to share with you. And this week, um, I do have something to share with you. It's one of the products of kind of the extra headspace that I've been able to give myself. I've been, you know, coming up with some other ideas for videos. And uh, this, this idea is based on the fact that um, I've been getting a lot of emails for the last couple of years, people asking me questions about clubs, um, my advice on certain things. And it dawned on me that I should be sharing these answers with you because I'm sure they're not the only ones asking these questions. So again, that's one of those things that I was so caught up in trying to do the video a week that I didn't have any time to think bigger picture and think out of the box about how to kind of present other information to you. And so that is kind of, um, you know, the, what we have here now is the mailbag. Uh, and that's a product of me being able to step back and give myself some creative room. So um, this week's question and the very first question in this series is going to be from Paul Martin. He just actually emailed me a couple days ago. And uh, what I'm going to do is work through my email and my messages and, and comments and find uh, interesting questions that I've received over the last, you know, several year, uh, several, couple years at least, um, and then present them this way. And, and Paul's question, uh, I'll just read it to you here. So uh, he says, love your website. The tutorials on how to have been most helpful. And I would like your answer on whether restoring clubs for collection display or for play will make them more readily saleable. I have around 40 clubs that I have restored that are ready to sell, but I'm now wondering if I should epoxy the heads and make them suitable for play. I realize this would also require new grips and would take away the antique look the original grips gave the clubs. Can you offer any sage advice? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Paul. I responded in length to uh, him earlier today, and I'll kind of touch on my answer to him in this video. Um, but basically what I said to Paul was that I categorize my clubs three ways. Uh, category one would be clubs that are collectible, that have no play, uh, you know, or you shouldn't want to play with those clubs, either because they're rare or they're valuable, or they're just, you know, they're obviously um, more suited to be a, a display piece than something you'd put in your bag and take out on the golf course and risk breaking it. So that's category one. 
Category two would be clubs that are kind of the opposite, where their value or their, their um, the reason why you want to have them is because they're good players, not because they're collectible. And there are millions of clubs made during the Hickory era, so there are a lot of clubs that people consider commons or that collectors consider commons uh, that actually are great players. And, uh, you know, the value of those, again, is the fact that they're good player clubs, not that they're necessarily collectible. So that's category two. Category three would be clubs that actually do have some collectability, but your, you know, the reason why you have them is kind of taking the driver's seat as to what you do with them uh, from a restoration perspective. So if you have that club because you want to play with it, um, that's then it's a player for you, even though it does hold some collectible value. And the market for that club after you do that work is going to shift from being one for a collector solely to one that is more geared toward the player like you are. So let's break down those categories a little bit further. Uh, category one then is our collectible clubs, clubs that you wouldn't want to consider playing. Right behind me here is a Willie Dunn one-piece driver that uh, is from about 1900. That is a club that I would never consider playing because A, it's rare, and B, I don't think it would hold up very well to playing, and then you've got a broken club that otherwise presents pretty nicely on the wall. I don't normally like wall hangers, but you gotta have some you know, for your golf museum. Uh, so that's a club that I would consider a category one where its sole purpose is a collectible display piece. And when you have those pieces, you, in my opinion, you wanna leave them alone. Don't do anything to restore them or even make them look nicer uh, because you're gonna damage its resaleability. Uh, collectors want clubs that look like they were just found and had been left alone for a hundred years. Uh, so they want to see tattered grips. They want to see uh, patina on the head uh, if it's an iron. Uh, they want to see a club that looks about as close to original as you can get. They will make some exceptions for things like the whipping, if the, there's no whipping on the club or if the whipping looks like it's newer. Uh, that's a minor thing that collectors will overlook. Uh, as far as, you know, a club that's original or not. But um, basically, if you have any clubs and you've done some research and you determine that this club is rare and that you're not going to play with it and uh, that it, um, it is collectible or desirable, then just leave it alone. Um, that's kind of tough for some guys to do because they want to tinker with everything they have. But that takes us to category two because you get a lot of clubs to tinker with uh, if you're just trying to make clubs that are common clubs and you're trying to turn them into players. Um, so most of the clubs that I build my hickory sets with, the beginner hickory sets, um, which you can reach out to me if you're interested, um, those clubs are all basically what collectors would consider common clubs, but they've got playable specs. So the swing weight is good. Um, I've been able to find, you know, good lofts. Uh, the, the quality of the club is still good and ready to be played with. Uh, the shaft is nice. Um, you know, all those qualities that you want to find in a club that you're going to take out on the golf course and play with. Uh, that's what those Category 2 clubs are for me. So their value is primarily in um, the fact that they're playable, not so much that they're collectible. In fact, they may not be collectible at all. But this is the fun thing about Category 2 clubs is that uh, when you want to play with the club, obviously you need to do some work to it to make sure that the shaft won't break. So you do need to reset the head with epoxy. Uh, you might want to make it look a little bit nicer if it's rusted, so you'll remove the surface rust. You'll recondition the shaft. You'll put a new grip on it that makes sense for you because you're going to play with it. Um, all of those things make the club look nicer uh, and, and more refreshed, but they're also important for its playability. And so the value of that club, in my opinion, increases when you do that work to a club that's a player, because now the person down the line that you're going to sell that club to who wants to play it doesn't need to do that work or find somebody to do that work for them. So they're going to pay, you know, what you're asking because you've done that work and you've increased the value of what is otherwise just, you know, a random common hickory golf club and you've turned it into something that can be used. So uh, that's where the restoration actually helps the, the resale value, in my opinion. That takes us to category three, which is a little bit trickier. Um, and this is where your, uh, your priorities and why you have that club kind of come into play. And what I mean by that is if you're primarily a collector of things 
uh, but you play every once in a while, well, then any club that you acquire, you'll probably want to maintain the collector mindset for because that's probably going to be the market that you're moving in most of the time anyway, either buying clubs or if you have clubs to sell, you're going to be looking for other people like you that are collectors. And if that's the case, like I said, for category one clubs, just leave the clubs you have alone, keep them as original as possible, and um, that will maintain the value, whatever value there is for that club. Uh, if your primary purpose is to play with these clubs, then there are clubs that kind of fall into the category of collectible, but that also make good players. For instance, my favorite maker of clubs from 1900 to 1935 is Tom Stewart uh, from St. Andrews. And uh, I have several Tom Stewart clubs sitting right next to me here that are all ready to be played with. They're also collectible. Um, so the, the primary purpose for me having these clubs is to play with them. And I've done the work to make sure that these are tastefully um, and, and appropriately restored so that I can play with them comfortably without worrying about them breaking. Uh, but I'm also aware of the fact that by doing that, I may have limited their uh, potential to be sold to a pure collector who doesn't want to see the new pin that I put in this club or the new grip that replaced the original grip. Um, but I've also made it so that it's appealing to another person like me who's going to play with the club and recognizes the quality of a Tom Stewart and uh, wants to buy a restored, ready-to-play Tom Stewart. So that's kind of the nuance of those Category 3 clubs, you know, recognizing. And, and the best way to do this is just to read as many books, look on eBay, see as many clubs as you possibly can to get yourself um, you know, your knowledge base built up to understand what's, what's just a common club, what's actually a collectible club to some people, and what qualifies as both. So um, I think that kind of answers the question that Paul asked. Um, hopefully, you know, you, if you had the same question, that, that answered it for you as well. But feel free to drop a comment below if you want more information on what we're talking about here. And if you have any other questions about anything related to Hickory Golf or golf history in general that you think I might be able to answer, uh, drop a comment below, ask that question, or you can email me at thehickoryhacker at gmail.com. That'll do it for this edition of Mailbag. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next time. Take care.